I guess the main thing I need from a director when I'm working is his trust. I need to have, he has to trust that I'm going to do uh, the best I can for him or her and, uh, and do uh, everything I can to make the film work. Uh, that, it's that trust that sort of makes you do the best you can on a film. I got into the film business sort of by accident. I studied interior design at the University of Manitoba. I started working at uh, Manitoba Theatre Centre, and while I was working there, had a chance to uh, do some work on a movie called The Morning Suit, which was an early Canadian movie. Here, look, your suit is finished. Come, you must try it on. I didn't miss a single set of dailies where we'd look at what we shot the night before, you know, the day before, and. It was fascinating for me because I had never looked at things before within a frame. And just just looking at it and seeing how everything was composed for that frame. Um, it was just, it was an incredible learning experience. The first film that I did with David was in, in Edmonton and it was a film called Fast Company. The producer on that film, he called me and said, can you be on a plane tomorrow to come out to Alberta to work with uh, David Cronenberg? And I got on the plane the next morning and did the Fast Company with David, and uh, I, guess, uh, I guess it worked out all right because I've done a few since then with him. My favorite memory of Carol back then was her chasing a funny car, which is a sort of 2,000 horsepower uh, dragster with flame belching out of his eight huge exhaust pipes and here's Carol running after it with a piece of Mac tack you know to put this last little star and stripe you know that it on it before it you know before it blew them all off going 180 miles an hour as, as it turned out um, and uh, she was just not intimidated by this beast it was like a jungle beast and she was she was running after it with this piece of Mac tack that's Carol you know she was right to the last second. She's going to try and get it right. David's films all present challenges. There's, there's always a challenge, which is, I guess, why I like doing them. Dead Ringers, we decided at the beginning that the main luck was that it was going to be very cold. That these, these twins lived in a very cold, sort of steel, hard-edged environment. So I thought that going with a kind of an Italian, modern look was the way to go. And uh, so we, the sets were all built for that. Their, their apartment was built, their clinic was built. What is going on here? Because we were doing a lot of split screen, where we would split the screen so that we could have Jeremy Irons on either side, I tried to incorporate into the building of the set uh, a lot of vertical or horizontal lines so that we could split the screen, so that we'd have lines that were naturally there. The art of that was really, it was, for Carol, was to give everybody else maximum flexibility, which means that she doesn't have maximum flexibility. And that's where I, I talk about a production designer having to be selfless in a way, because in a way you are trying to give to everybody else, you know, to the actors, through the costumes, special effects, even through costumes. Um, and um, um, we, I, what I wanted was the flexibility to shoot 
the twins as though they were two separate people, two actors, and not have to worry about storyboards, which I didn't do. Uh, just say, okay, I'm going to block the scene with my actors this way, and now I'm going to have a shot where the two of them walk towards us and the camera backs up in this cafeteria. And it was Carol's art to, to give me sets that did not make that impossible. Naked Lunch was also a challenge. It was uh, originally set to be shot in Morocco uh, and with the studio being shot in Toronto and uh, all of the New York segments being shot in Toronto. It was uh, the time of the, of the uh, Gulf War and we had already started shooting and uh, when the war broke out and all of a sudden we couldn't go to Morocco anymore. What? And the project was going to fall through, and I said, well, I, I think that we can do it anyway because we've got measurements, you know? We went to Tangier, we've got photos and measurements, let's make it here in Toronto. So that is a huge challenge, I mean, for, for a production designer. I sat down, made a list of all the locations that we were going to shoot there, figured out what I could build in the studio in Toronto and what we could do on locations, building on locations in Toronto. And uh, then David took that list and then rewrote the script to accommodate that. And I think in the long run, it, I think it looked better. No point in feigning surprise. You knew we would be getting in touch with you. Why else would you come to a waterfront dive like this? Okay, cut. I have waited up to nine months to work on a movie with David. I don't know if I'll do that again, but <laughs> it's, uh, that was Naked Lunch. I mean, that was a special movie. Uh, but uh, I, I find myself in the position again of waiting for David Cronenberg again. And with any luck, we'll know in a couple of days whether we start. Hello, I'm David Cronenberg. I'm here to send you a few postcards from the world of existence. There's an intimacy involved in playing existence that is beyond description. So how does it feel? The game's a lot more fun when it starts feeling realer than real. I do feel the urge to kill someone here. Don't make me go back in there alone. Play with me. I think we're still inside the game. I usually send my script to several key people when it's very early on, when, it, when I really think it's in its first readable stage, and that would be my uh, composer, Howard Shore. That's because we have a very long relation, long-standing relationship. That is not perhaps a normal thing for a director to do, is to immediately send a script to a composer, but I do that. To a cameraman, uh, and because, once again, I have a long-standing relationship with uh, Peter Sushitsky, and we've done many movies together. And I value his opinion not simply as a, as a director of photography. Um, and my editor, and, of course, Carol Spear, my production designer, who's designed almost everything that I've ever done. Um, and it's feedback because I want them to tell me they like the script, of course, and I want them to start thinking about it maybe years in advance of the actual production happening. As a production designer on the film, you're pretty much responsible for everything that's seen on the screen and pulling it together. You don't do everything that is there, but it's kind of establishing a look and working with everybody in the different departments to pull it all together and to make it work as a whole. It's sort of a very much a team effort and, and uh, it's sort of overseeing everybody, I guess, and making sure that all the talents kind of are going in the same direction. The first thing after reading the script is 
I sit down, I mean, I, I start, as I'm reading, I start just imagining what it would look like. And I break it down. I break down the, the script in terms of the different areas, the locations, the, uh, the set decorating, the props, the special effects. And then as I break down each location, I decide with discussions with the director which ones would be uh, practical locations and which would be sets built in the studio. And then we discuss the characters and who they are and where they've come from and what, what they're doing and sort of starting to get a general idea of what the look of the film's going to be. Basically, what you expect from a production designer is total production design. That means that she's going to be involved in everything, every aspect of everything, almost mainly, perhaps only, to the exclusion of casting the movie, even though I do talk to her about that as well. Um, uh, and that's only almost because of the timing of how things work. But... Um, Special effects and production design go absolutely hand in hand. Uh, if you're doing fire, then what the walls are made of, can the place be made safe to have fire gags happen? And I expect the uh, special effects supervisor and the production designer to really deal with those things. The effects have started a lot earlier than the production design uh, because there's so many strange little creatures and, and special effects. David and I had to, uh, had a lot of conversations and a lot of R&D and development work. But once Carol gets involved, uh, first thing we do is Carol and I sit down and just go through the script and talk about where, design-wise, where the, the two departments mesh. Because we really don't think of the departments necessarily as separate departments. We're all basically working together to try to create David's vision. Okay, let's see some movement on the right. Now, left. Let's go. No pop. No pop. Oh, you waited too long to pop it. Yeah, well, I saw it. Uh, <laughs> I think it's ready to eat now, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it certainly smells like it. Hard flambe is, you know, <laughs> it's one Did of my favorites. Technically, we just go through scene by scene, and we talk about, um, for example, we have a diseased pod in this film that gets burnt, a test we did earlier, it, does, it gets burnt, it does all these crazy things, it's going to be in a, a basket, and it will have cables running through it, it'll go through the set, and so one of the things that we were talking about is she will say, what, what do you need? And then I'll discuss, we'll talk about what I need as far as how high I need the set to be built, and, and basically she'll, she'll take in in her design of a set, she'll incorporate my, my needs, or the effects needs, or anybody else's needs, for that matter. And she does that with every effect. And almost every effect uh, has something to do with, obviously, the production design in the design, in the concept, but also just technically. Uh, with the pod and the pod design, in the script, there it calls for, in the first scene of the movie, for the pods uh, to be taken out of these cases. So the first thing we had to do was design the pod, which took a very long time. Once we got to the shape that we liked and David liked, then Carol then got involved as far as uh, designing the, the case. And so what we would do is give her, say, the pod and, you know, umbi cords, which we call it umbi cords, and let them play with it, basically, and let them do what we had a chance to do with the pod, which is to just create different designs and different shapes. In the script, it describes these cases which hold these organic and therefore very delicate pods, the game pods, uh, I, descri I describe them as looking almost like ski boots. And so uh, the props guys and Carol and, and the art director, um, Tamara, all, we all got together and said, okay, what was it that you saw, they said to me, in a ski boot that m made you describe it that way? And some of the things were obvious that it you know that it could that it would protect that it was hard surfaced and hard shelled and that you but it was small enough to carry and so on well it doesn't open because it's one big block of clay but it'll it, it'll have a shoulder strap and and it'll be carried around by the main character who's the game designer and she'll open it by pressing here opening inside will be nestled the the game pod there so i've sort of sculpted it to kind of echo the feel of the pod and what we wanted to do was get a very sort of organic, clam-like feel to it. 
and the little umbi cord, as this is called, which is the GamePod connector, will fit in there. We encourage consumer loyalty and we want you to help us with our product testing. We're a team, Antenna and you. Those of you who have come to our invited seminars before will know that I normally lead the groups through our new games. And suddenly I had this moment of epiphany where I thought, it should be a ski boot. Why are we making fake ski boots or almost ski boots or something that almost looks like a... The ski boot is what I want. And make sure I don't lose everything I have in here. And it's so oblique and odd that a ski boot should be used as as this pod case. And then, of course, we realized that there were lines in the script where a character says everything seems to have been something else at one time. And that is really part of the feeling of the movie and part of the theme of the movie. And then suddenly it was exciting and great and metaphorically perfect that it should be a ski boot that was the pod carrying case. David, David's very good in being able to, when he sees something, to say wh whether he likes it or doesn't like it. He can't always say why he doesn't like it, but there, usually as you start to work things through, you start to see the reasons why he didn't like it. The church is, uh, is the very opening scene in the film. It is also the final scene in the film. Uh, David wanted it to definitely be something in the country. He wanted a very simple country look for the picture. Actually, I, I figured out what I wanted the interior to look like before I <laughs> went looking for the exterior. So we had something in mind when we were looking for it. And the, and the locations people got in the cars and drove around and we looked at different churches. We looked at churches, photographs of churches and books of churches in Canada. Decided what the good points were about some, what the bad points were, narrowed them down, and then we show David the, the same location photographs. And if he likes them, we we go out and look at the actual location. Plus the steeple on the top. Right. Probably we'll have to tie back into the church to support it at okay. the front. So we'll have to have some kind of you know we'll have to uh -huh. nail adhere, in it. Yeah, yeah, adhere it. Yeah, adhere to the front. Yeah. Right here. Basically, the big things are adding the steeple and, and how we're going to attach it, which is what I need to talk to the folks about, you know, and I'll get drawings for them and show them exactly what's going to happen, which is the great thing about working with Carol is she always gets her plans together and her drawings, and then I can go and I have a very professional ap approach to discussing everything. It's not just sort of going in and this is what we want to do. and. You know, what do you think about that? They can actually see what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be attaching things. And then on the side, we'll probably we'll have to go into the roof too. So we'll try to do mm -hmm. that really carefully, and we'll shingle around it. And, try mm -hmm. and then any, any, I think we can do it without making any holes in the roof. We don't have to worry about that. We needed a very secluded church, as close to Toronto as possible, with surrounded by trees on sort of a country road, dirt road, gravel road, with trees across the street. And this, you know, fit the bill perfectly. When we did look at a location that we were going to use the exterior of, we were very excited by many of the details that were there in the real church, this real, actually, hundred-odd-year-old country church. Um, but it was too small. It was absolutely too small. The proportions were wrong for the kind of scene that we had in mind, the number of people we needed to have inside, and then when you factor in trying to light it with crew and everything else, it was too small. So what I wanted from that was the the tone, the feeling of that actual location, but but made bigger on a different scale, and and yet I still wanted the textures, you know, and um, so really that's. That's what Carol could give me. She could bring the reality to it, the reality of that little beautiful country church to what was a set that was, of course, just created out of raw space to begin with, which is a quite a magical thing to be able to do. With David, I like to work with models a lot, and I think you know, building a model of the church it was very helpful. It gives you an idea three-dimensionally of what things are going to look like. Let's lift that. Yeah. How tall is this person? Five foot six. I well, five foot six. I have a, a periscope that he can get right into the model of the set, get an idea of angles that he can have when he's shooting. Okay. Now we the giant camera descends from the sky, representing God, of course. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so we go through here. Yeah. Thought we'd actually put some pews in here too, as if there were pews left there and pews on the mezzanine, mm -hmm. and maybe now, a few in the back corner, and the rest have been removed. So we don't, we can't afford pews, is that it? Yeah. So I thought what I'd do is make it the, like if, if it was a painted floor, we could make it look as if there had been pews in there at mm -hmm. one point, and the, you They've can see you can see the, where they were, and the, the paint's all built up. And yeah. Let's get a price on the pews and just see. I mean, this isn't horrible. Mm -hmm. and it might be better, I'm not sure, but I'd like to just... Well, those ones in that little church did look good. They did and look they good. they could be kind of interesting. Though. And how, if we do the pews, how, where would they... You'd have an aisle? We could do it either way. You could have an aisle down the center. Is there a more traditional way that it's done one way or It another? depends on the size of the church. Yeah. If you have a larger church, they tend to try and have it down the center because it's better for funerals and yeah. weddings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Would this qualify as a bit yeah. larger church? Yeah. No. <laughs> when he saw the model, he decided that he would rather go with pews after all. I think also after seeing some of the, the pews in the church uh, that we were using as the exterior location, uh, he changed his mind about wanting pews instead of having an empty church, which was his original concept. Good. to the demoness Allegra Geller. No! <laughs> Dead to our tele research! <laughs> Generally, when I'm working on the design of a set for a film, I start with very preliminary plans, very simple elementary plans. Uh, elevations, which are looking straight on at the, at the chalet. There are more variations of a theme. This is a plan with the, uh, for the workshop chalet, which is a different furniture layout. Um, this is a very, very sort of simple sketch of what the exterior will look like. Unfortunately, it's not facing quite the same way as on our location because we've changed it. After I've kind of worked out the sizes and, and kept in mind the kind of action that has to take place in the space, I'd hand the, these drawings, which are very preliminary drawings, uh, over to an assistant art director or set designer who will then draw up the detailed working drawings. Uh, and also with, with an assistant, they'll, I'll work with them to, to build uh, a model like this. And uh, it also helps the carpenters, too, to understand how it all fits.